<clears throat> Hello to everybody out there in Periscope land. This is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope. And uh, I'd like to apologize on the last attempt to do my scope. Uh, somehow it froze up on me, and I'm just going to have to reiterate kind of everything I just said. So just guys, guys, just bear with me here. Um, I definitely want to, uh, for people to, to, how's it going there, Howie? I definitely want people to get the full, all the information that they need uh, as we're going through this. So I'm definitely going to have to reiterate a lot of things. So um, thank you guys for your patience and prayers. And uh, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Hey, how's it going there, Annie? Uh, nice of you to join us. Um, uh, I definitely appreciate, um, all that would watch. Uh, I, I would, I'd hope that you'd pray for me and for this ministry that we'd reach as many people with the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm going to flip the screen here, um, really quick. Um, guys, Romans 9 is not going to be an easy chapter for us to, to cover. Um, we're definitely going to try to painstakingly go through some things that are that cause a lot of people confusion, but this definitely is not an exhaustive study. Okay, I know it sounds exhaustive. I know we go through a lot of things in Romans. This is not exhaustive, okay? Um, th we're just hitting this verse by verse, and I call this an overview. Some people say, whoa, Brother Ed, this is like intense, man. You're, you're hitting the verses. You're zooming in on some things. I still call it an overview review because there are so many avenues to travel on on these verses but what I'm trying to do is so we can get an overview is to basically understand what the verses are actually saying and then kind of zoom out and apply other concepts with the scriptures around the same topic and we can shed light on all the shady passages of scripture and then that way when we zoom out and look at the whole Romans 9 we can get an overview and nobody should be confused or end up in false doctrine whether it's Calvinism or you know black Hebrew Israelites white Hebrew Israelites who knows guys that's that's where these cults come from they come from Romans 9 10 and 11 um, they end up just mangling up the context and cherry picking verses and thus you end up in false doctrine and then all these cults get started and guys there is a historical context and there is a application where you do precept upon precept um yeah des yeah 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 we preach down there as well i mean i i'm pretty sure you watched some of the scopes that we did down there yeah i definitely preached down at university of central florida and we we talked to as many people as we can i mean there's, you know, we're in America, you know, so it's a melting pot of a lot of different beliefs, and there's a lot of different belief systems out there. To USF, oh, okay, yeah, um, yeah, we go to UCF, that's University of Central Florida, it's in Orlando, and that's where we go um, uh, monthly. That's our monthly ministry, and we try to reach the college or university, excuse me, the university students down there with the gospel in which we get a lot of, uh, mainly a lot of atheist and philosophy students come and want to, you, you know, they just want to badger us, but we try to win them, you know, no matter who they are, we try to win them to Jesus Christ. But you guys pray for that ministry as well. I mean, we try to reach people and yeah, right, Des, right. Yeah, I ain't seen you in a while, um, but you probably been busy as well. Amen there, Des, will do, will do. All right, guys, let, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, what I was going to do is start with Romans 9, 17. Um, my disclaimer on the last scope was we were going to cover the hardening of Pharaoh's heart because so many Calvinists jump into the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Um, amen. Will do, Des. Um, the, uh, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is such a strong um, argument that Calvinists think they have on um, their Calvinism because uh, God sat there and hardened Pharaoh's heart, meaning that from the foundations of the world that God wanted Pharaoh to go to hell and uh, just to show his glory and power through God raining judgments on him because God knew that he was going to rain all those judgments on him so Pharaoh could just die and go to hell. And that's how God raised up Pharaoh to show his power. Okay, so... That's the assumption that Calvinists give, and what we're going to do is we're going to show, we're going to shed light according to the Bible on this thing, okay? 
All right, Des, um, really quick, because you're on topic, definitely on topic right now. So we are not far off. Um, the assumption, and I, that's why I'm saying assumption. Amen there, Des. I appreciate you standing up for me like that. Um, yeah, um, you already know my what my answer would be, definitely. Um, our, the Calvinist position is this, is that you're either a Calvinist or an Armenian. And... I don't hold to that because I know what Armenians believe and I don't believe the same thing they believe in. Um, I don't believe in the prevenient grace of God. I don't believe in that. Um, there, are, there are aspects of Armenianism that are still Calvinistic that I don't believe in. Now, Calvinism in of itself, uh, TULIP, is the foundation of Calvinism. I don't believe any of that. So I'm not a Calvinist and I'm not an Armenian. What I am is, you are correct, Des, by saying I am a Bible believer because Bible believers don't agree with a whole lot of doctrines that are out there that are mainline Christianity. You know what I mean? It's just taught through tradition in Baptist churches. I mean, there's some things in Methodist churches that, you know, I may agree with, but I don't agree with everything Methodist churches believe. So I don't classify myself as a Methodist. Um, There's some things that Catholics got right, and they got the Trinity right. But when you're dealing with salvation, they say you got to you gotta have works in order to be saved. So I'm not a Catholic, because you're always looking for what can save a soul, okay? That's what you're looking for. What can save your soul? And whoever's going to get that thing right, it better be according to the Scriptures, and most everybody gets it wrong, and it's not according to the scriptures. It's according to tradition or how we've always believed it, our church constitution, our confession of faith, and forget what the Bible says. We're just going to go by what our church has always believed. And that's where, you know, we as Bible believers draw the line. And if my, if, if my church would end up going on that road to do a church constitution and it's not scriptural, I would, I would, I would be out of here. I, 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 without a shadow of a doubt, I'd be out of here. But because our doctrine and our beliefs and our everything, everything about us to, to, to the utter, you know, soul of, of who we are, we believe the Bible. And if the Bible can correct us, we'll be corrected by the word of God. We don't let man-made doctrine correct us. We let the Bible correct us. Do I think that God hears the prayers of Jews who don't believe in Jesus? Well, uh, wait for him since we're on topic because we're dealing with the Jews right now, Romans 9. I thank you for keeping it on topic. Um, I, this is what I believe. I believe that it's only by grace through faith. Now, if the Jew is trying to, now uh, Isaiah 59, okay, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. And here's what it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Now, whether you're a, a Jew or you're a Gentile, God will not hear your prayer unless you come to God taking care of those sins. Now, in our dispensation right now, after Jesus died on the cross for our sins, the only way a Jew can um, get his sins dealt with is by Jesus Christ. If he doesn't want to get that paid for by Jesus Christ, he's going to end up dying in his sins and going to hell. And that's that, you know, that's Luke 16. Okay. That's a very good question though. I'm glad you asked that. There may have been many other people with that same question on here. And, and um, it, it's, it's according to what we're dealing with anyway. So praise the Lord. Um, God's wrath is on all unbelievers. Right. Right, how we said it, that's what it is in a nutshell, okay, guys? Um, the wrath of God is on all people, all unbelievers, okay? Now, the moment when you repent and you get saved, then you don't, you're not under the wrath of God anymore, according to John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, what are we dealing with with the Jews, in Romans 9, we're mainly dealing with Jews because at the very beginning of Romans 9, we're dealing with, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now, why would Paul have continual sorrow in his heart? Why would his conscience bear witness in the Holy Ghost that he would have this sorrow in his heart, this great heaviness? 
You know why? Because he knows that Israel's not saved. Now, we're talking about a whole nation here. We're not talking about certain individuals. Now, you could have some kind of a, a you know, you know, we all do. We Come on, we all have this. In our conscience, we have members of our family that are not saved. We have people, close friends, that we were friends when we were lost. We have people that were not saved, and we want them to be saved. And so our hearts are hurting for those people that they would get saved, right? But that's not what we're dealing with here in Romans 9. What we're dealing with is a, a specific person, Paul. Okay, now it has to be that because we are not reverting back to the church right now. We're dealing with Israel because Romans 9, that's dealing with Israel, exclusively Israel, mainly. And later we're going to get, we're going to bring the Gentiles and we're going to show where they stand dispensationally, okay? In this, you know, when we're dealing in this nation, this national thing, dealing with nations, okay? Because what are we used to as the church, when we apply, when we go to the Bible and we're taught in our mainline Christian churches, we're just taught everything is about us. Everything is about the church. Everything is about, you know, the believer. It's not. It's not all about the believer. And that's where we all fell on our faces in, in mainline Christianity, okay? Including me, because I started off in one of them churches, which taught me that everything is the church. You know, there is no Israel anymore. It, 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 now Israel is trans, transported or transformed into the church. So, I mean, I can see there's other people on here that were taught that as well. And and the problem is Romans 11 gives the answer or, or gives the answer to the Jewish question. Um, it says, hath God cast away his people? And he says, no, he did not cast away his people. It's God forbid. Now, if God did not cast away his people, then mainline Christianity has fell on its face because they totally disregarded Romans uh, 11 with the Jewish question. And so what did they do? They robbed the Jews of their heritage. Right. Their eyes are blinded right now, but there's still a remnant out there. He has kept a remnant of the Jews out there. Now, who are the remnant? We don't know who the remnant are. Only God knows who the remnant are, but what does everybody want to do? The black Hebrew Israelites make it them. The white Hebrew Israelites make it them. You got Indian Hebrew Israelites that make it them. You got Mexican Hebrew Israelites that make it them. Guys, we don't know who they are. We don't know. And, and, and I'll, I'll prove it. Ezekiel 37 says he will bring them all back into the land in one day. And that, that hasn't happened yet. And what does what do your news broadcast say? What do your conspiracy theory people say? What do they all say, guys? When, when Israel became a nation in 1948, that was a fulfillment of prophecy. I say, no, that's not the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. That's not a, a fulfillment of Isaiah where it said they would be a nation in one day. That's not the fulfillment because the nation in one day is all the nation of Israel converting to, G, to believing on Jesus Christ in one day. Now, go to Israel right now if, if you believe that that's fulfillment of prophecy. Go there right now and ask a Jew, do you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day? And watch him shun you. Watch him spit in your face. Guys, we're not just saying one Jew. We're not saying 15 Jews. We're not saying 30, 40, 50 Jews. We're not saying a, a Jewish city. We're saying every Jew will believe that Christ died for his sins, was buried and rose again the third day, according to Hosea chapter, or not Hosea, um, Zechariah chapter 12 in Ezekiel 37. There it is. Read those two chapters and you'll see every single Jew, every single one in that nation is going to believe on Jesus Christ when they look upon him whom they have pierced. They're going to look upon him and they're going to believe. And in one day, they're all going to believe in Jesus Christ. And one day God will put his heart in their heart, in their stony flesh. See, what do we always do? We always apply those verses to us. You see, you guys see that now, that that's what I'm talking about. And we all fell on our faces when we believed in mainline Christianity. What we need to do, guys, is just have a biblical stand. And even even though we may find some problems, I, I, I don't say problems, I'm using that subjectively, okay? There are going to be things that we're going to talk about in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that are going to kind of rub you the wrong way, okay? And that's okay, 
if you're willing to humble yourself and you're willing to learn, there may be some things that we're covering. And then later we're going to look at some other passages. You're going to be like, wait a minute. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And then when we hit the other passage, it's like, okay, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I didn't see that passage right there. So just bear with me. I'm guys, I'm wrong about some things. I, I, I'm wrong about things all the time. Just bear with me. Okay. We're going to, we're going to labor through this together and um, we're going to do our best. I am not, I am not the, the PhD specialist on a lot of these things, but we're going to do our best because I've spent a lot of time studying these things and um, I'm hoping to be a blessing to maybe get another perspective besides a mainline Christianity. That way we can just say, wait a minute, I may not agree with everything Brother Ed said, but there's some merit to this stuff. I need it. And, and that's, that's what I'm trying to get you guys to do. There's some merit to this stuff. Let me, let me dig deeper in my Bible and learn out, learn this whole thing out. And that's what I'm trying to promote you guys to do. You don't got to believe everything that comes out of my mouth, but all the things that are scripturally correct, you guys, you, you got to submit to that because if it's scripturally right and I'm reading it right off the screen right out of the Bible then I mean there's some things we just got to say well there's well, a shot of a doubt that's what it says and then there's other things we can say well that's what it says we need to explain it more with other verses so that's how we study our Bible okay so with that being said I kind of rambling on right now sorry about that guys but um first I want to go to Romans 9 17 okay I'm going to flip the screen we're going to have a look at this okay now um let me clear this up. I always use my title screen to kind of clear this up. There you go. And um, we're going to cover Pharaoh. Okay. Now, why is Pharaoh so significant? Because he was the Pharaoh of Egypt. We're not, we're talking about an individual, right? Um, yeah, it is. it's, yeah, it's Sword Searcher 8, 8.0, right? Um, it's, it's, it was made by Brandon Staggs, if you're interested in looking that up, swordsearcher.com. Okay, so what we have, guys, is Pharaoh, who is Pharaoh of Egypt, okay? He was Pharaoh of all of Egypt, so we're not, we are dealing with Pharaoh as a person, but we're also dealing with the whole Egyptian nation, okay? That's what we're dealing with, the whole Egyptian nation, okay? That other nations might fear for what God would be doing to Pharaoh in Egypt, you see that? So for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now, I don't know if you guys remember on the last scope, we covered this. God, God didn't have to raise Pharaoh up to destroy him, to show his power in him by destroying him. What are some other ways God could have uh, raised up Pharaoh to show his power in him? See, Calvinists would like to say, well, God from the foundations of the world destroyed Pharaoh and, and, and or wanted to destroy Pharaoh because God already knew he was going to destroy him. And that's not what it says. Now, now I want to show you some other ways God shows his power. Okay, let's go ahead and do this. Genesis 31, 6. And ye know that with all my power... I have served your father. So we're not, we're not really zooming in on, on the context too much as to just to see that, look, power, I have served your father. So obedience to another, God can show his power. You see that? Through obedience to another. Now, let's go to Genesis 31, 29. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. So you see that in the context here? It's power and hurt. So there is, there is a God showing his power to hurt somebody by destroying somebody. Now, let's go to another way that God can show his power. Psalm 106.8. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake that he might make his what? Mighty power to be known. Now you see that? Now in this case of power, God's using his power to save people. So when he's showing his power in somebody, it doesn't always mean to destroy people. Now let's do another one. Romans, Romans 9.22 and that's where we're at, you know, in the, in the, in the text as well. And we're going to get to this verse, but we just want to see this. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his what? 
his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Now, what is he? What's God's power doing right there? It's enduring with much long suffering, and what does that mean? That's self control. You see that? God can show his power in his long suffering. Now, let's do another one. Ephesians 3, 7. Whereof I was, was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So he was made a minister, right? And that was the power of God. You see that? God doesn't always um, show his power in people to destroy them. That's the point I'm trying to make. And Calvinists will tell you that Romans 9, 17, that's God raising up Pharaoh because from the foundations of the world, God decided to destroy Pharaoh and use him as an example to show his power. And God already planned this thing out and he didn't. He didn't. Now, watch this one. Let's go to verse 20 in Ephesians 3. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the what? The power. Have a good night, are you saved? According to the power that worketh in us. Do you guys see that? So right here in Ephesians 3.20, we're dealing with a changed life. God has the power to work in us and give us a changed life. You see that? So it's not always destruction. It's not always God wanting to kill us, okay? And that's what Calvinists would like to say about Romans 9, 17. Now, we're, we're going to do two more, okay? Because we're gonna just going to kind of beat this horse to death, okay? So let's go ahead and do it. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the what? The power of God. So what are we getting in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 on the power of God? Well, it's the preaching of the gospel of Christ, right? That's the power of God. Now, is, God, is God's power in 1 Corinthians 1.18 to destroy people or to save people? <laughs> See, this is what I'm talking about. These verses refute people saying that God was showing power in Pharaoh solely to destroy him, okay? Now, let's do one more. Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, now, you see that? Now, let's learn about the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay? So, where, what is the power of God doing right here? It's, the, it's obviously the gospel of Christ. That's the power of God. But to who? To those that believe it. So believing the gospel of Christ is the power of God. So one is the preaching of the gospel of Christ is the power of God. And the other one in Romans 1.16 is believing the gospel of Christ is the power of God. Do you guys see that? So hopefully now that we got seven ways that God can show his power according to Romans 9.17. So remember, we were just here. This is our um, premise verse here. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. Now, God gave how many plagues to Egypt? How many plagues? Can anybody put that on my screen? How many plagues? We're doing a little bit of trivia right now, since we're having fun on a Friday night. Uh, Bible trivia. How many plagues did God send to Egypt? Does anybody know? Seven? Oh, pretty close. Pretty close. Anybody else? Ten. Amen. Ten. All right. There we go. Thanks. Thanks for answering, guys. All right. We got ten plagues. Amen. So we got ten plagues. Now, here's my question to you. How many times? Now, this is... you. Now, uh, I know... I, if I was put on the spot with this, I wouldn't know this either. So... I'm just, I'm just fishing for somebody to maybe, if they've studied their Bible, you know, to an extent and maybe know this, um, I would try to ask this, okay? If you don't know it, that's fine. We'll go through it. There's, there's no pride going on here. Just, I just, I just want to, you know, involve people in, in the scope. So, um, how many times do you think that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Can, w would anybody like to guess? Or, or if the, if you know, just put it on the screen. 
Um, I think this would be fun to do. Just just throw throw some random answers up. <laughs> Howie, you're funny. <laughs> Guys, um, yeah, I, I just thought, yeah, yeah, wait for him, put five. Anybody else want to give a guess? I mean, it doesn't hurt to guess. I just want you guys to be involved. I mean, I know I've been preaching a lot on here, and I don't give you guys a chance to kind of, uh, you know, kind of um, converse with me and stuff. So um, I, I want to ask a few questions and just kind of involve everybody in this, kind of draw some more interest, you know. Um, so I have five. Anybody else want to put another answer up? So so we got 10 plagues. And then what we're asking is, how many times did God harden his heart? Okay, how he says three. Okay, so what we're going to do, guys, um, um, very good guesses, guys. I mean, better have a guess than no guess at all. Um, but again, um, it's going to take a lot of painstaking work to kind of uh, track down in the Old Testament, in Exodus, every time God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So what I did, I kind of did the work for you guys. And um, this is not conclusive. If you find another verse, please, you know, please let me know. Um, I'm, I'm willing to, to change my, my, my mind if I'm wrong about a verse, okay? So um, here it is, guys. We have seven times God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Seven times. And we're going to hit each and every one of these. Um, and then and then I want to show you this. There are seven times that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now, how many plagues were on Egypt? We just said it. There are ten plagues. How many times was Pharaoh's heart hardened? Fourteen times. Do you know what's going on there, guys? There's some grace going on right there with God. God is God. God is saying, you know, Pharaoh, even though you harden your heart more than ten times, I've given you grace. I didn't give you fourteen plagues, but I've given you ten because I've got grace. And you know what, guys? Let me give you a reminder too about the plagues. Do you know the plagues didn't kill them? Do you, you guys understand that the plagues didn't kill them? So you know what we're dealing with right there? We're dealing with God's mercy and his grace, even when we're dealing in the plagues. What was the whole goal for the plagues that when Moses was warning Pharaoh, what, were the, what was the goal of the plagues? That Pharaoh would believe the word of God coming from Moses' mouth, that he would let the people go, and thus he would be obeying who? Moses or God? He would be believing Moses by faith or God by faith. You see that? God was trying to show Pharaoh mercy. He was trying to shed grace upon Pharaoh, but Pharaoh didn't want it. Pharaoh didn't want it. And so he hardened his heart. And thus, you ready? And thus the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay, so who hardens their heart first? The person hardens their heart first. And then God, in response, hardens their heart. Think about that. Let, let that soak in, because we're about to cover these, okay? Let me flip the screen here. Um, let me clear this up a little bit. It's kind of blurry. There we go. All right. Now, remember, guys, we're, we're covering... This is our premise verse right here, okay? We're dealing with Pharaoh. We need to understand Pharaoh in Romans 9. We need to understand the nation of Egypt, you know, in response to what we're dealing with in Romans 9 according to Israel. Now, as we're understanding the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, we're going to understand Israel a little bit better as Paul is applying Pharaoh here in Romans 9 to say, wait a minute, you see how Pharaoh hardened his heart? Israel's doing the same thing. Now, we'll cover that in a minute, okay? First, we're going to try to cover this hardening of the heart, and we'll hit our first verse here, Exodus 7.13. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now, you see that? He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? The Lord did, right? So there you have it. There's the verse. There's the proof. Now, let's do another one. We're only looking at the Lord hardening his heart. Now, the next time the Lord hardens his heart is Exodus 9, 12. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Now, let's go to the next one. 
Here's the, here is the third time the Lord hardens his heart. Now, I'm being subjective about this because I'm just showing you what it, what it actually says in the Bible, and we'll cover. I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a minute. And the Lord said unto Moses, go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. See, the Lord says, I have hardened his heart. So who hardened it? The Lord did. Now, let's go to the next one, Exodus 10, 27. And Moses said, or I'm sorry, uh, verse 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Do you see that? Now, let, let, let's do the next one. So that's one, two, three, four. So we're on the fourth one. Now we're on the fifth one where the Lord hardened his heart. Now watch this. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Do you guys see that? Here it specifically says the Lord hardened his heart. That's why we know the Lord hardened it, because it actually says he hardened it. Okay, now let's, let's do another one. Exodus 14, 8, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So there we go. That's six times, right? But brother Ed, didn't you say it was seven times the Lord hardened? Exactly. It was seven times. Here we go. Exodus 9, 7. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. Now watch this. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Now, what's the problem in this passage? It doesn't say the Lord hardened his heart. And it doesn't say Pharaoh hardened his heart. It just says, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, right? Right? So what we have right there in Exodus 9, 7 is a neutral I call these neutrals, okay? So how many neutrals are there in the Bible? Okay, you guys ready? So we got a, a, we got a good six times the Lord hardened his heart. Now I'm gonna prove the seventh in a minute. First, we're gonna understand the neutrals and then we'll go back and then we'll be able to apply this, okay? Now watch this, let's hit the neutrals. Exodus 7.22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now, it didn't say Pharaoh hardened his heart, and it doesn't say the Lord hardened his heart, right? <laughs> it's a neutral. It could be either or, right? <laughs> now, let's do another one. Um, we did, we did um, Exodus 9-7. We did Exodus 7-22. So, I got, I got two neutrals. That's it. That's all I got for neutrals. I got two neutrals, okay? Now, we're, okay, so we did the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart six times. We have three neutrals. Now we're going to go to Pharaoh. How many times did Pharaoh harden his heart? Now I have this one right here, Exodus 8, 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, now look, he hardened his heart. See, this is exclusively that Pharaoh himself hardened his own heart. See Exodus 8.15. Now watch this. This is number two. Exodus 9.34 to 35. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Do you guys see that? Pharaoh hardened his own heart right there. You guys got to pay attention to this because um, you need to know that it was six times that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. There was three neutral times where we can't figure out who hardened his heart. And now we've got one, two, okay, that's Pharaoh, and then two, two times where Pharaoh actually hardened his own heart. Now, how do we reconcile this? This is, this is not easy, guys. This is, this is not easy. This is a tough thing to do. But with a little bit of patience, we can do this, okay? Now, I want to I show you something. Exodus 7. This is all chronological. Exodus 7, Exodus 7.22, or Exodus 7.13, Exodus 7.22, Exodus 8.15, and Exodus 8.19. Now, all of those, 
Now, the Lord did it in Exodus 7, 13. It was neutral in Exodus 7. It was the Pharaoh that did in Exodus 8. And then in Exodus 8, also 19, it was neutral. So we have a mix of different things right there. Let me... I want to flip the screen, but really quick, let's just hit the verse. Now watch this. All the way from Exodus 7.13 to Exodus 8.19, the Lord neutral, Pharaoh, and, and the, another neutral, what do we have? Exodus 8.32. Now, now look at the bottom here. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now watch this. At this time also. Neither would he let the people go. What did you notice about this verse? There's, there's a tricky wording in here. Look, Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Meaning, okay, you guys ready for this? Meaning that everything from Exodus 7 all the way to Exodus 8.32, Pharaoh could have been hardening his heart the whole time. Do you guys see that? So we don't need the semantics of, well, it was a Lord, it was a neutral, it was Pharaoh. All those times, Pharaoh hardened his heart, even though the Lord hardened his heart in some of those times. <laughs> All right, guys. Now, how did, now, how do we cover, remember that one neutral I gave in Exodus 9-7? And we said, well, the Lord could have did it seven times. Now we, now we can understand that. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. So who hardened his heart? Well, obviously from Exodus 8.32, when it says Pharaoh hardened his heart also in all the other times, here we have the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and then also the Lord hardening his heart. Now, I have seven times the Lord hardened his heart, okay? I have seven times Pharaoh hardened his heart, including the neutrals. So what do we understand on this? Okay, I don't want you guys to get too confused on here because I know probably what I just said was all confusing. It was all jumbled up. And it would do, it, it probably would have done me good to show you a chart. I think a chart would have done a lot better than to just kind of explain it like I explained it. But here's what I'll do, guys. God knew Pharaoh would not let the Israelites go. But God is a merciful and gracious God. So instead of killing Pharaoh, he hardened his heart for the purpose of them knowing, knowing that he is the Lord and letting the Israelites go. There is a grand total of 14 times Pharaoh's heart was hardened. You say, but the Lord hardened his heart. No, what we say is every time Pharaoh hardened his heart, guess who was meeting him with a, a, an extra hardening of his heart? The Lord was meeting him right there. Guys, you want to harden your heart against the Lord? The Lord will harden your heart. Okay? Seven times. Seven times. And seven times the Lord hardened his heart. Now, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, um, according to the carnal and natural man. Amen there, nine. Appreciate your encouragement. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart, according to the carnal and natural man, would have to be studied how we did it above, attributing the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now, I, the reason why I said above, because I made my chart there, and I didn't want to show it to you guys. It's really confusing. It's got everything just jumbled up. And I mean, I understand it, but I know if I show you that chart, I'm, it just caused more confusion. I don't want you guys to be confused on this thing. So, um, so here we go. We did it above attributing the hardening of Pharaoh's heart seven times to God and seven times to Pharaoh. However, we look at the two times Pharaoh and the Lord hardened the heart at the same time. We can only come to the conclusion that God knew Pharaoh would harden his heart and God would give him what he wanted. So we would say Pharaoh hardened his heart 14 times and God hardened his heart 14 times in response to Pharaoh. So when Moses asks to let the Israelites go, God knew he would have to bring forth plagues to soften, to soften the heart of Pharaoh, to let the people go and bring to Pharaoh's reality that God is the Lord. 
That's what I got, guys. I studied this thing out. I mean, if you guys got more, maybe later on you can email me. I got my email on my bio page. If you guys disagree with something, email me on my bio page. You know, I'm, I'm open, you know, for correction. If you got verses to back yourself up, I definitely, um, I'll submit to the Bible. I'll definitely submit to the Bible, okay? So um, that's just a thought, okay? I didn't say it was. I'm saying this is a thought. I've considered as many verses as I could. Um, I try to do an exhaustive study on this. Right, right, Pine, right. A amen. Um, so, so what you guys can see is we have a truth prevalent here on the hardening of Pharaoh's heart that Pharaoh didn't have to harden his heart. It wasn't something that was preordained by God that Pharaoh needed to harden his heart for that time, I mean, Pharaoh could have repented at any moment and let the people go and became a proselyte. And by faith, God would have saved him. But he didn't. He chose not to. So when people try to apply Romans 9 to, to Calvinism and they go back to Pharaoh and show how from the foundations of the world, God already knew Pharaoh was going to do all that. They, 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 have no, no, they have no understanding of Romans 1 where God uh, gives people up to a uh, to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. They have no understanding of um, Romans 1, where it deals with he gives them up to vile affections. And every time he gives them up, how does it apply to our lives? Well, um, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at right now there, um, wait for him. Um, let me just finish the, the thought here. Um, and then I'll show you how we can uh, apply it practically. Good, good, good comment though. Um, so, and I forgot forgot my train of thought. Now, where was I? Um, yeah, we're talking about Pharaoh and God hardening his heart, and you know, God hardened his heart not so not, not so he could destroy him. Okay, God hardened his heart so that he would get mercy from God, because that's what Romans 9 tells us. We need, um, he, needed, he needed that mercy from God, but he didn't want it. He needed compassion from God, but he didn't want it. And so we tell a lost and dying world every day, you need God's compassion, you need God's mercy, but even though you don't want it, you can harden your heart, and God will harden your heart with you, know, with you, if, you if that's what you want. But God will not make you believe. God did not make Pharaoh believe. He had a choice. Pharaoh didn't want to believe, so he suffered the wages of sin. Okay? That's what happened to Pharaoh. Now, what's going to happen to us every time we reject God? Now, if you're lost, you keep rejecting God. Ultimately, death's going to get you. Ultimately, hell's going to get you. The wages of sin, it's there. You, 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 you reap what you sow. Now, if you're saved and you want to be in disobedience as a carnal Christian, death's going to come get you. You're not going to go to hell, but death's going to get you. Disease, sickness, reaping what you sow is going to get you. Now, I'm not threatening anybody. I'm just telling you, this is what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. Now, we said it uh, in prior scopes when we hit Romans 6, that Romans 6 is applied to save people. You could die an early death. You could end up dying an early death if you don't, if you want to continue in sin, okay? That's what's going to end up happening. Amen there, Pine. It, it is. It's a dangerous place to be, away from God, whether you're saved or lost, okay? Amen. It is. Liberty and freedom. Amen. I, I definitely agree with that. Praise the Lord. Um, so, the question now we need to ask is, why? Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And we kind of answered that a little bit. Right, nine, amen, amen. So um, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And so we answered one aspect of that. We, 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 we said that he chose because he loved darkness rather than light, and he just wanted to harden his heart through pride, okay? But then, but let's go to the Bible. Let's see what the Bible says about why God hardened his heart. Let's go to Exodus 14.4, okay? I'll flip the screen here so we can, we can look at the, the Bible. Um, let me... Uh, let me clear it up like that. There you go. Okay, there we go. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now watch this. That he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. 
You see that? So God wanted to be honored, right? He wanted Pharaoh, look, he was hardening Pharaoh's heart that he should follow after them and will be honored upon Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh didn't want to honor God. You see that? That's why he did it. Now, now, now let's go to 1417 in, in Exodus. And I behold, now watch this. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Do you guys see that? That's why he hardened his heart. So he would get honor from Pharaoh and from all the other Egyptians. Remember, I told you we're not just dealing with, with Pharaoh. We're also dealing with the nation of Egypt. Okay? So remember, guys, when a lot of times we apply, you know, these verses, we always apply it to individuals. We never apply them to nations. So we're dealing with the nation of Egypt and God hardening their hearts because they wanted to harden their hearts. So when they harden their hearts, God respond God responds in hardening their hearts. That's how God responds. Now, I want to back that up because I know those are powerful assumptions and they're they're powerful claims. And it's it's saying it, it's me saying one thing and me proving it in the Bible is another thing. So let's go ahead and do it. Now watch this. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, do you see where God gives them up to uncleanness? Now, what did they do for God to give them up to uncleanness? Are you guys ready? Look at verse 23. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So what did they do first? They changed the glory of God into statues, into things that look like idols made with hands. You see that? And God responds with, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. So now watch this. Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. Question, why did God give them up to vile affections? You ready? For this cause. What was the cause? Look at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. You want to change the truth of God into a lie? Well, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. You see that? Let's do it again. Now watch this. Let's go in the middle. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now question, why did God give them over to a reprobate mind? Because he just felt like it? Or the beginning of the verse. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So what does man do first? He sins against God. He goes towards darkness. And what does God do? God responds in giving them what they want. Do you see that? I just backed up my claim. That's Romans 1, okay? You say, where does it say that at? Romans 1, we just read it. God will not give you over to a reprobate mind unless you don't want to retain God in your knowledge. Look, God won't give you up to vile affections if you don't change the truth of God into a lie. Look, God won't give you up to uncleanness if you won't change the glory of God into things made like statues and beasts and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Okay, do you guys see that man man's the one that hardens his heart and then God responds by hardening the heart. Do you guys see that? I hope there's no misunderstanding on this because then you're in the realm of Calvinism when you're saying from the foundation of the world, God made Pharaoh to go to hell. No, no, he didn't. He didn't make Pharaoh to go to hell. He wanted to have mercy on him. And again, that brings us right back. Hold on. Let me, let me do it this way. This would be a lot faster. Let's go right back to Romans 9, 17. Now watch this. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, for even for the same purpose uh, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. 
Now, look at the next verse. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. Do you guys see that? So if Pharaoh wanted mercy, he could have got mercy because God's given us the preordained way to get mercy. How do we get mercy, guys? We get mercy by grace through faith in what God reveals to us. In the Old Testament, Pharaoh could have got mercy by, by responding to what God has revealed to him. But what was God revealing to him at the time? He would let the people go. He could have became a proselyte. He could say, wait a minute, there's no other God like this God to perform such miracles in the glory of Israel, in the glory of the world. I, I've never seen miracles like this. Let me convert to and be a proselyte. Let me, let, let, me, let me be an Israelite. But he didn't. He didn't. So what did Pharaoh do? He hardened his heart. And whom God does, he hardeneth. You want to harden your heart, God will harden it. That's, see, that's how you apply these verses. And the problem is people don't apply those verses that way. Right away they say, well, you know, God, you know, the scriptures say that the Pharaoh, for the same purpose, he raised thee up. See, so God, God created Pharaoh to destroy him with his power. And so, so that his name would be declared throughout all the earth that God destroyed uh, Pharaoh in Egypt. No, guys. The same way that God destroyed Pharaoh, Pharaoh didn't have to be destroyed. The same way that Pharaoh um, hardened his heart could have been the same way that Pharaoh softened his heart and repented. And you know what? I said this before, that I might show my power in thee. If Pharaoh got saved, I'm talking about by grace through faith, not believing on Jesus. There was no Jesus back then, okay? We're talking about believing God by faith. Pharaoh could have got saved and you know what? God would have showed his power in him. And this verse would still be as true as it is today. And look, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You see that? That's the truth that we're trying to bring. That's the practical application, okay? Don't, look guys, when you're out there in the world, we all ought to declare the glory of God to all the other nations. We all ought to be missionaries. We ought to be missionaries in our own town. We ought to be missionaries at home. We ought to be missionaries everywhere we go. You know why? We need to be declaring the name of the Lord throughout all the earth. And you know why? Because God has showed his power in us. The moment we believe the gospel, God has showed his power in us. The moment we trusted that Christ died for our sins, he was buried and rose again the third day, God showed his power in us. <laughs> Amen, Pine. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is by faith. Praise the Lord. By grace through faith. Amen. Um, yeah, I mean, um, wait for me. That's a good question. She she asked about, um, you know, did Pharaoh ever believe? I mean, we, we'd like to hope he did. I mean, that would be that would be a great thing if he if he really got saved. I mean, we don't know if he did, but that would be a great thing if he did. I mean, we'd hope, like I said, we'd hope that he got saved and that, that would be a blessed thing to know. But um, as far as proving it in the Bible, I don't think we have enough passages in the Bible to support that. All, all we know is it's just up in the air. It's just up for subjective opinion, you know. But um, again, um, he could have been saved. I mean, if he got right with God, um, it's kind of like Nebuchadnezzar. You know, we have some proof that Nebuchadnezzar might have gotten saved as well, you know. So, um, but yeah, um, great question, though. Uh, pretty deep, pretty deep question. Praise the Lord. All right, guys, um, so what we covered, we covered seven ways that God can show his power according to Romans 9, 17. We did that. Um, and then we also covered um, the 14 ways or 14 hardenings of Pharaoh's heart, um, seven times where Pharaoh did it and seven times where the Lord did it. But ultimately, we ended up boiling it down to God hardened his heart all 14 times because Pharaoh hardened his heart all 14 times. Okay, so so um, hopefully we have an understanding of that. Um, let me see if I have any more on this. Um, the account from the Philistines. Oh, this is pretty good. Um, we didn't hit this one. Wherefore, then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. So it didn't say... Uh, wherefore do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians 
and Pharaoh hardened their hearts some of the time or seven times. It says they hardened their hearts. So we can only assume from 1 Samuel 6.6 6, that every single time that God hardened their hearts, it was a result of them hardening their hearts. See, you see how we do this. We get verse and precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Yes, uh, she's here. She's here with me. Um, okay, guys, I think we, I think we hit that. I think we kind of, um, we, it wasn't, it wasn't conclusive, but you know, there, there's still room for more preaching. There's still room for more studying. And I, I would suggest anybody go back and study these things and it'll be a blessing to just go back and just, you know, you know, glean more truth out, you know, say, hey, brother Ed didn't say this or brother Ed didn't say that. I mean, people normally do that anyways with me. Oh, you know, brother Ed, you know, you forgot to say this or brother Ed, you said that wrong. You know, they, you know, they were they weren't babies. They were full grown men. Okay. I understand that. Okay. So may I'm wrong about that or I am wrong about that. Okay. You got me. Okay. So if, if your goal is just to tear me down and just to show how right you are. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm just here to teach guys. I just want to be a blessing. I've learned, I've learned these truths and I, I, I'm not saying I'm without error. Okay. I, I've got a lot of error. Okay. We all do. So, um, just, Come on a scope, learn, be a blessing. I'll try to be a blessing to you. And and it's just a class. I mean, what class have you ever went to where the teacher wasn't wrong about something? I mean, that would have to be a great teacher. <laughs> so guys, I mean, we're all wrong about things. So what we do is, you know what we do when we find somebody preach something wrong? We give them the benefit of the doubt. We know their heart's in the right place. You know, we know they're, that they're meaning well. And and if I see something wrong, I told you, I'll, I'll admit it. I'll go back. I'll, you know, I'll apologize. I apologize. I, I was wrong about something, you know? Um... So there we go, guys. So I think we covered that well. Let's go back to Romans 9, 17, and let's kind of continue on a little bit more. And then we'll kind of end maybe a little bit further than we did from verse 19, because we kept we keep stopping on verse 19. Uh, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? Or who hath resisted his will? I think we kind of, you know, maxed out on preaching on that. Let's go to verse 20. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Hey, that sounds like uh, what God was telling Job in the book of Job. Remember that? Who are you to reply against me? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? And now you, you can apply that two ways. And there may be even more ways to apply it than that. But the two ways that I'm familiar with is the Calvinistic way. You know, people say in Calvinism, God made me to a sinner. So I have no power to do but what I'm doing because God made me that way. Now that's Calvinism, guys. I don't believe that. Look, look, look what it is, guys. We're asking questions. Are there not two questions being asked? Okay, now watch this. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Well, I'm asked, I'm, you know, God, you're asking me the question, God, through, through Paul and her divine inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm a nobody. I'm a speck of dust. I'm nobody to reply against you. But you know what the problem is? There are people that read the Bible, read the word of God, understand the Bible. And you know what they would do? They would reply against God. They would. They would reply against God. Now look, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Now, you can apply that a few ways. Did, did God make you a sinner? Well, we're not going to apply it like a Calvinist. How are we going to apply that verse? Well, let's try to apply it, apply it more like a Bible believer. Why hast thou made me thus? Well, God, you made me a human being. You made me to know good and evil. I know both. You've, you've given me a measure of faith, Romans 12. Um, God, you've given me light, John chapter 1. God, you've made me upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29. God, why hast thou made me thus? You made me. Why would you even make me, God? You're so great. You don't need me, God. See how we can apply that? It doesn't always have to be in the Calvinistic light, but 
but nine out of 10 times when you go to your commentaries, that's, this is the kind of stuff you're going to get, okay? And so God didn't make anybody a prostitute. God didn't make anybody to get on a scope to try to, to, try to draw people in to be trolls, to uh, watch pornography websites. See, you can't ask the question, why hast thou made me thus? God didn't make you that way. But you know what people do? They love their, their sexual immorality. They love their pornography. And they would love for, for people to get on their websites and click on these links and then defile you. Defile the innocence of those that would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Defile the innocence of people that wouldn't normally look at those sites and draw people in. And then you would dare ask as the people that's, that's drawing the other people in, they would say, but I just do it because God has made me thus. God's made me this way. He's made me sexually immoral. And the problem with that is God did not make you that way. God, I'll say it again. God has dealt with every man the measure of faith. Are you a wool man? Yes. God dealt with every man the measure of faith. John chapter 1, he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You've got light. And when you hear the word of God and you harden your heart to the word of God as Pharaoh did, you've got no excuse when you stand before God. You've got nobody to blame but yourself as you get tossed into that lake of fire and you lift up your eyes being in torments, having rejected the truth that Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. What a shame that somebody would hear this much Bible truth and still try to draw people away from the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth of the word of God, and yet people will still do it. But you know, the problem is God didn't make you that way. God didn't make you to sin. You choose to sin on your own. Okay, now let's back this up as we read verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, where, where do you go when you're dealing with Calvinists to defend yourself against their preordained doctrine of predestination and them not even understanding predestination and what it means? And what would they say about Romans 9.21? Okay, you guys ready? Well, you see God, right? He's the potter, and he has power over the clay. Now, God created us, see, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor, see? So God can save people, and another unto dishonor, and God can cast people into the lake of fire. Now, let's back it up, Brother Ed, because since you don't like Calvinism, I'm going to prove Calvinism. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering? Now watch this, Brother Ed. The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. You see, Brother Ed, Calvinism is true. God creates people to go to hell. <laughs> All right, guys. See, the, the, the problem is the verses don't say that. The problem is mainline Christianity has assumed the Calvinistic position on these verses. And that's a problem. Now, let's read this as a Bible believer. You guys ready? Let's do it. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Absolutely. God is the potter. He has power over the clay. Amen. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto, on, unto honor. Question, how do you get honor? Is there something that you have to do in your vessel to get honor? Yes. <laughs> So God will make your, a vessel unto honor depending on what kind of vessel it is. Look, and another unto dishonor. Will God dishonor some vessels? Yes, because the vessel is dishonorable. What are you going to do with your vessel? Will you be a vessel where God can make that vessel unto honor depending on what you've d d done for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this body of flesh? Huh? The vessel is the flesh. And another unto dishonor. Now watch this. Let's go ahead and back that up because I know people kind of be like, well, no, no, brother Ed, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in the. Okay, all right, I understand. So 
what we're going to do is cross-reference. We're going to shed more light on the passage, okay? 1 Thessalonians 4.4. 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his what? Does that say vessel? Yes. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. Now, does it say that God would make sure he would make you a vessel of dishonor? It doesn't say that. Now, watch this. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. Now, watch this. In sanctification and what? And what? Honor. Do you guys see that? Now, if I would make my vessel a vessel of sanctification and honor, guess what God can do to my vessel? He can make it honorable. See, see, guys, this is what I'm talking about. People don't read the Bible and they end up being Calvinists. Now, let's do another one. 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So here's something you have to do. You got to depart from iniquity. God will not make you depart from iniquity, will he? This is something you have to do. Now look at verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver. Now, now guys, see this. Vessels. Ain't that what we're talking about? Vessels. Now, there's a great house. What's the great house? Well, my friend, that would be you. There's a great house, and, and there's vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to what? Here we go. This is our Romans passage. Some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, watch verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these... He shall be a vessel unto what? Unto honor. Now, is there something you have to do? You have to purge yourself, right? If you want to be a vessel of honor, you have to purge yourself. And guess what, you're, guess what God's going to do for you if you're a vessel of honor? Watch this. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. Now, watch this. And meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Wow, I think we just proved our case scripturally, did we not? I think this is almost an overkill on what we were dealing with, but I think it needs to be said. So let's go back to... Right, right, Pine, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let's go back to Romans 9.21. Now, now we got understanding of what's going on here. Because Bible doesn't contradict the Bible, does it? The Bible cross-references the Bible. There are no contradictions in our Bible, okay? So therefore, we need to reconcile these things so we can understand them without any contradictions. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Yes, he does. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor. How will he make a vessel unto honor? Well, we just said it in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Timothy 2. If you will be a vessel of sanctification and honor... If you will honor God in your vessel, then God will honor you. See, he'll make you a vessel unto honor. <laughs> All right. And another unto dishonor. Yes, that's the question. Yes. If you want to be a vessel of dishonor, then don't be sanctified. Don't be a vessel of honor to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Reject God and God will make you a vessel unto dishonor. Do you see that? See how that works, guys? No contradictions in the Bible and no Calvinism in the Bible. You see that? Everything can be explained scripturally. If you're a Bible believer, if you're not a Bible believer, you don't want to go by the Bible, then everything is going to contradict and it's not really going to matter anyways. But we believe the Bible to be inspired and preserved. These are the very words of God he wanted for mankind to know. So we're going to believe what the Bible says, okay? Now, this is going to be our last verse. It's going to be a challenging one, but this will be our last verse for the night, okay? Verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, 
Amen there, Pine. Appreciate you. Thank you for the encouragement. If you'd please pray for this ministry, I definitely need uh, prayer for this. Amen. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Do you guys see that? The word fitted. You guys see the word fitted there? People will take that word fitted to destruction to say God has created people for destruction from the foundations of the earth. And God didn't make anybody fitted for destruction from the foundations of the earth, okay? Now, we just said it before. If you want to be a vessel of honor unto God, then you're, you are going to obey the precepts and statutes of God's word. And if you want to be a vessel of dishonor, then you're going to reject everything God has for you, including salvation in Christ Jesus, okay? But that's up to you. That's not a choice that God's going to make for you. And God didn't create anybody to go to hell, okay? So right now we have volition. Everybody's a free moral agent to choose to do right or to choose to do wrong. You can choose to obey God. You can choose to obey the devil. You can choose to obey the spirit. You can choose to obey the flesh. It's up to you. God will not make you do any of those things. It's something that you have to do by your own volition and free will. Okay, that's going to be vitally important as we understand Romans 9 as well to combat Calvinism, which is false doctrine. Okay, so to be fitted, listen to this to be fitted, you must make yourself fit in the object you are trying to fit into. So, fitted right here is concerning are we going to do something where we're going to make ourselves fit? To destruction. And that's that's that would be a vessel of wrath. The vessel of wrath isn't God making us vessels of wrath. Vessels of wrath means I am a vessel of wrath. Okay? I'm serving sin. I'm serving the flesh. I'm serving the devil. I'm serving the world, not God. And therefore, I am a vessel of wrath. Now, I want to back that up. Let's back that vessels of wrath up with Ephesians chapter 2. Now, watch this, guys. I didn't plan on going here, but I think it's a good cross-reference, so it gets some understanding here. Now, watch this. And you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So, before we were saved, we were quickened, made alive. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, what do you mean by that? Let's, let's keep reading. Wherein in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world. So what did we walk according to? The course of this world. According to who? The prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. That's, that's the devil. We all walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Now look, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's what we were when we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were children of disobedience. Now look at this. Among whom also we all, see that? We all had our conversation in time past. And that conversation right there is our conduct. Our conduct in time past in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath. Do you guys see that? Vessels of wrath. I want you guys to soak that in. Vessels of wrath. I didn't even have this in my cross reference on my notes, but I'm definitely going to add it in there. And I, I suggest you guys add it in your notes too. It's a very good cross reference. Children of wrath, vessels of wrath. You see how we just cross referenced uh, the two verses together. So look, vessels of wrath. That's what we were. We were vessels of wrath. And look, fitted to destruction, not because God made us that way. We're fitted to destruction because we chose to be vessels of wrath. Amen, guys. I, I, I actually uh, learned a little something today on Romans 9 as well. I mean, um, I'm being blessed as well. I mean, praise the Lord. I just learned something new on Ephesians 2. I mean, I never thought about linking those two together, just came to mind. Praise the Lord. So let's read this again. What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known. Now, look, look, look. He's going to make his power known. You know, his wrath, right? Now, watch this. Endured with much long suffering. 
Now, how come nobody ever covers this endured with much long suffering whenever they preach Romans 9.22? You know why? Because right away they want to assume that God created people to go to hell. Why would God endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction if he made them to go to hell? He would not be enduring with much long suffering. He'd be like, guys, I created you to go to hell. What are you guys waiting for? I'm sending you there right now. But no, God's got grace. God's got mercy. And he endures with much long suffering. He doesn't want to see a single soul perish. He wants every single soul to be saved. And when you're a vast vessel of wrath, you're not a vessel of wrath because God created you to be one. You're a vessel of wrath because you did that by your free choice to love darkness rather than light, to love your sin more than God who died for your sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. You did it all on your own. You got nobody to blame but yourself. And that's why the Bible says they have no excuse. Romans chapter one, there is no excuse for any of us. And the Bible says he endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Guys, don't be that vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. Get out of being a child of wrath. Get into the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to save you from your sins. If you would simply believe and trust in him, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's the love of God. That's the mercy of God. Guys, if you're not saved today, if you're a Jew... If, you're a, if you call yourself a Jew, you call yourself an Israelite, you call yourself the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Nephtali, Gad, and Asher, any of the tribes of Israel, okay? Any of those tribes, if you're an unbeliever, now's the time you get the thing right. You know what I'm saying is true. You know that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. You know that's true. And the problem is, the reason why people won't believe is because the Bible says it in John chapter 3. This is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. People won't come to Jesus because they love darkness rather than light. But I tell you this, it's not impossible for you to come to the light if you would simply humble yourself and lower your pride. God, God is more than willing to forgive you. He, he is. If he can forgive a wicked sinner like me, he can certainly, he can certainly forgive anybody. I hope you guys look into this thing. Um, go back, watch the scope. I don't delete any of my scopes, guys. Go back and watch. Um, learn the verses, learn the word of God. You don't got to believe me, guys. Just go back to the Bible and read it for yourself. Learn the love of God. Learn what it means. Um, learn the wrath of God. Learn what it means. Some people think God's just out there just trying to, to, to throw people in hell, and God's not. God didn't even create hell for, for human beings. He created hell for the devil and his angels, and that's what the Bible says. It's not what Brother Ed says. It's what the Bible says. So, guys, just look, look, look these things up. Um, consider what Jesus has done for you on the cross if you're not saved, and if you are saved, consider living a holy life for him that's pleasing to him, that would honor him for the rest of your life. Right, gamers. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of people that don't care about religion. Absolutely. There's probably more people that don't care about religion than do. Um, I mean, the Bible says straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So um, Jesus even knew that only a few people were going to find the right way. And even though he loves everyone, um, he wants everyone to be saved there's still going to be people that don't want it. And there's going to be people that understand it and that they still won't want it. And they're just people that are just indifferent. They, they could care less if it's true or not. And um, there's just different personalities of different people. And all we can do is just try our best to reach as many as, as, as we can. Um, what do you mean like, like your calendar? I, I didn't understand that. Um, but we're going to do our best to try to reach as many people as we can. We're, we're, not, um, we're not sinless. Um, we're all a bunch of sinners. We're saved by grace. Jesus saved us. We, we're still a bunch of sinners, even though Jesus saved us. But the difference is, is that Jesus saved us. That's the difference. That means I, I, I'm not going to hell anymore. And anybody that's saved is not going to hell anymore. Why? Because Jesus has paid it all. He's paid for all of our sins. 
And he doesn't just make us better off. He makes us better because now we have a better life to live in Christ Jesus. So, guys, um, thanks for the questions, guys. Thanks for being respectful on here. I appreciate um, all of you to get on here just to, you know, even consider listening on my scope. I mean, there's only a few people on here, but I I mean, just if one person got on here, it would be a blessing, you know. And, and if not, I'd still be a blessing if I preached by myself on here because I learn a lot just even preaching on the scope myself because I'm in the Word of God. So guys, thank you again for joining me on KJV Bible Scope. I hope you go back and look at these things. You know, you don't got to believe me by face value. Go back and read the Bible and just trust the Word of God. I mean, if, if, there's, any, if there's anything I can point you to, it's Jesus Christ and the Holy Word of God, the King James Bible. Just believe on that and, and you're, you're headed down the right road, guys. So um, thank you again. Um, Please pray for this ministry. I, 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 I won't stop asking for that. I, I definitely covet your, your prayers if you pray for this. I want to reach as many people as I can on the scope. I know definitely um, it's, it's in the will of God to reach as many people to be saved. Um, guys, I want people to know the Bible. There's so much false doctrine out there. It's just, it's a shame that there's, I mean, when you get on a scope and you just see the different beliefs that are out there, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, when, whenever we view in our own little worldview, we see, we always think that everybody sees the world as we see it. And it's not really true, guys. There are so many different uh, melting pot of beliefs out there that we definitely need to learn how to deal with people, learn, you know, other people's beliefs, and then learn how to reach them with the saving gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So guys, um, that's, I mean, that's my desire, guys. I mean, this is almost like missionary work. You're trying to reach people all across, you know, the web, worldwide web. But I mean, unlike many other scopes, because it's the, a Bible scope, people really don't find any interest in it because it's, we're reading the Bible verse by verse. It's just not a desired thing in our day and age of entertainment and internet and everything is fast paced. So reading the Bible is just, it's out of date. It's with, with, with the times of Western culture, it's out of date with, um, to them, we're a bunch of Bronze Age people that don't understand anything. We're still living in Bedouin days that, that we don't understand what electricity is. And and that's kind of their, their view of us. But I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring it on the Internet, the Word of God on the Internet, to show people that you can have an understanding of the Bible verse by verse, you know, if you want to. You you can still have an understanding if you want to. And, and I'm trying to bring it you know, to people that probably would never look at a Bible ever in their life. And so, Lord willing, you guys pray for this, that it'll reach people. It'll the, the Word of God will be planted in their hearts. And maybe one day down the road, they'll get saved and trust in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to pray for, guys. I'm definitely going to be praying for this. Um, I pray for all my scopes. I pray for the people on here. I pray for you guys on here. Amen. Amen. Wait for him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, we want people to trust in Jesus Christ and believe on him. And, uh, yeah, we'll definitely pray for that guys. Um, thank you guys. Um, right. Yeah. Wait for him. Absolutely. Um, all right. Um, guys, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. Um, uh, thank you guys for joining me. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we really covered this. It was a lot of labor guys. It was, it was a pretty long scope and, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. Thank you for joining me, KJV Bible Scope. My name is Brother Ed, and may the Lord richly bless you. You guys have a great evening.